today with our second keynote, which will be given by Anna Peters, whom you see on the screen, and we're delighted to welcome virtually to this workshop. Anna is the, one of the directors of the Max Planck Institute uh, in Heidelberg, one of the epicenters of international legal research, and uh, she is also a past president of the European Society of International Law and a new president of the German Society of International Law. Despite having worked through the established mainstream institutions, I think one of the terms that was used yesterday, Anna has certainly brought innovative and fresh approaches to all of these. And as somebody who has um, well followed her, well followed her development since I was a student at Kiel, where she completed her postdoc studies with a mixture of admiration and fascination, I can say she stands out that despite having reached all these pinnacles, she has remained a curious and intellectually um, ambitious scholar who continues to do her own research rather than directing the research of others. She does that too. But I think what makes her stand out certainly in the continental international law landscape is that she has never published or written books. She's never stopped writing books and monographs. So that's something we can all aspire to. Anna, we've had a first day of discussions about all sorts of things, about friendship in international law, about investment protection and its origins, uh, about uh, the League of Nations, uh, really sort of few topics were off topic. Um, you're now going to speak to us about the social side of international law and we look forward to your discussion. We hope the technique works out well, but we're delighted that you're joining, that the technique allows us sort of to, uh, to be joined by you from it. Many thanks and welcome to Anna Peters. Thank you very much for inviting me and I really regret that I can't be there in person. It's actually the first time I'm doing such a talk by Skype. The talk will give you a big picture with all problems attached to giving a big picture. It contains brutal simplifications and take it as one of many possible proposals about how to interpret uh, what's currently going on in international legal uh, law. Um, I start with Venezuela as an example where the conflict between the dictator Maduro and the leader of, of the opposition, Guaido, is waged on the back of the suffering population. As you know, people are dying because the hospitals can't function, there's no electricity, no water, no pharmaceuticals, no bread. The United Nations estimates that until the end of this year, six million, and that is a, a large part of the population will leave the country. The population in Venezuela has neither time nor energy for protesting against the government meant anymore, the government which steered the resource-rich country into chaos and poverty. The population cannot convincingly back the opposition's leader because now everyone is busy with trying to survive. This ongoing scene illustrates the frequent confluence of material deprivation and ideational deprivation of poverty and bondage. And concomitantly, the political opposition demanding reforms uh, reacts against both harms, not only against the deprivation of freedom through censorship and discrimination, but also against the denial of basic social needs. The key point now is nowadays that this classic interdependence and interaction between the ideational and the material condition of life nowadays happens in a globalized environment. So what has been called the social question cannot be resolved at the national level. And indeed, international law and the governing institutions are responding to this. The main objective of my presentation is to highlight and to pull together these trends towards a more social international law. I hope that pulling them together will show them in a new light. At the end, in my outlook, I suggest to analyze these trends through the lens of global constitutionalism, which is again, of course, only one of many possible lenses, but the one I prefer. First, I need to clarify what I mean by the social. The concept well, the word social has its origin in the Latin word socius, which means companion or ally. Social is present in terms such as socialism in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, or in the European Social Charter, or in the concept of corporate social responsibility, 
Social policies range from social assistance, social, social security, social insurance schemes, over a labor market policy and an educational policy. In my presentation now, I don't focus on social in a different, broader sense. Everything connected to a collective or to a group, to a society, as the opposite of private or as the opposite of individual. Social in that broad sense figures, for example, in Article 28 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which mentions a social and international order. So I don't focus on that, but rather on social as an attribute of laws, as an attribute of policies and institutions which seek to improve the material living conditions of humans and which seek to mitigate poverty and inequality of wealth and income. Domestic legal institutions which do that are known as the welfare state. But the welfare state is under stress. Already in 1990, the German sociologist Ulrich Beck wrote a famous book about globalization. He writes that, I quote him, the premises of the welfare state melt under the withering sun of globalization. Globalization has been dubbed as being essentially neoliberalism writ large. It is today obvious that the Washington consensus has not delivered the promise of welfare for all through trickle-down effects realized through the market. Large groups of persons, mainly in the global south, have only marginally or not at all benefited from global trade and investment but have become victims of technical and demographic change, of pollution, and have lost their homes and jobs. It's therefore not surprising that the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, in 2016 identified a groundswell of discontent with globalization. I also mentioned that on the handout. Awareness of the dark sides of globalization has changed not only the political tides, but has also triggered new scholarship. The search for a post-neoliberalism and a post-Washington consensus as an intellectual framework is ongoing. Philosophers have attacked the global political and legal order as conveying and perpetuating a fundamental structural social injustice against populations of the global south. Economists, Piketty, have uncovered the profound unfairness of capital accumulation protected by our financial system. Sociologists are asking for a new social settlement under conditions of globalization. These debates accompany the timid expression of a more social and more individualized legal framework, which is, I claim, in the making. This is not to deny that international law was, from its beginnings on, a droit international liberal providence, liberal and welfareist, as Emmanuel Tomjoanet called it. International law has worked and is working on the dual agenda of promoting both freedom and prosperity. Think of the International Labour Organization founded in 1919 as a bulwark against the Bolshevik Revolution. Think of United Nations Charter Chapter 9 on international economic and social cooperation. However, I assert, and this is of course simplistic, but I think we need such simplification to be able to see change, that the new social law is different. The crucial difference between the old interstate international law of solidarity and development and the new more social law is its attention to individuals across state boundaries and its acknowledgement of a cross-border social responsibility for individuals, as I will now try to demonstrate. I reach my main part, and you can follow it on the handout. I see five trends in the direction of a more social international law. I use 2015 as a marker for a turn of the tide. Of course, it's just a symbolic marker for more protracted and not fully linear trends. In 2015, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Agenda 2030. Agenda 2030 has been qualified by NGO observers and by scholars as historic and as a change of paradigm. 
coalescing around the time of 2015, I see five trends in the direction of a more social international law. The first trend is the emergence of an international law against poverty. This is a response to the failure of classic international development law. Sustainable Development Goal, SDG number one, is to end poverty in all its forms everywhere. The World Bank has espoused the fight against poverty as its major new cause and has to some extent supplanted its traditional focus on development, now understood as human development and good governance. The displacement of the policy objective from trying to develop countries to combating poverty encapsulates a twofold shift. First, it downsizes the ambition. Combating poverty sounds much more modest goal than reforming a country and revamping an economy. Second, targeting poverty facially deflects the focus from macroeconomics and legal and political institutions to the individual and his or her needs. The individualist turn seeks to harness socioeconomic rights as a vehicle and a tool for combating poverty. In this policy, the needs of the individual are the ultimate normative reference point. But what has been touted as a success by the World Bank has been called into question by critical analysts. Notably, Thomas Pogge has relentlessly uncovered flaws in the World Bank's definitions, measurements, and other data on poverty. Pogge went as far as criticizing the MDGs as, I quote, Pogge, a cruel joke upon the poor, the celebration of a vast crime against humanity. Even if we don't want to go as far as Pogge, it remains unclear how much, if at all, international law and institutions, as opposed to other factors, contributed to lifting people out of poverty worldwide, for example, in Asia. The second trend is the emergence of an international law against inequality. This responds to the widely shared perception that within most countries, the gap between rich and poor is growing, to use the words of a recent OECD report. A new way of looking at global inequality in times of globalization has been suggested by the World Bank economist Branko Milanovic. According to Milanovic's famous elephant graph, which you probably know, the last 20 years period of intense economic globalization have produced two big winners, namely poorer people in emerging countries and super rich individuals from developed states, mostly the US. The biggest losers are poor and working class people in rich states. To put it simply, in the current constellation, there is roughly the period of a convergence of wealth, of decreasing inequality among states, but accompanied by a growing material inequality of individuals within states. And this inter-individual inequality has been recently acknowledged as an issue for international law and governance. In his foreword to the first issue of a new World Bank series of studies on poverty, the World Bank president writes, I'll quote him, Today we face a powerful threat to progress around the world, inequality. High income inequality is hardly new in human history, but today inequality is constraining national economies and destabilizing global collaboration in ways that put humanity's most critical achievements and aspirations at risk, says the World Bank president. Along the same line, the 2030 Agenda has formulated the mitigation of inequality of wealth and income among individuals as an official development goal. Uh, the declaration says uh, that it wants to combat inequalities within countries, in paragraph 3. And the 2030 Declaration also says that growth will only be possible if wealth is shared and income inequality is addressed. Accordingly, goal 10 of the Agenda 2030 itself is to reduce inequality within countries. Point 10.1 seeks to progressively achieve and sustain income growth at the bottom of the 40% of the population at a higher rate than the national average. 
and in order to reduce this intra-state inequality. So inside the states, goal 10 for is to adopt especially fiscal policies, wage policies and social protection policies to progressively achieve greater equality. The formulation of such an explicit goal to reach, to reduce inequality, has been called one of the most remarkable results of the SDG negotiations. But it has also been said that the agenda's concrete formulation is completely insufficient for substantially reducing the inequality of income. Now you can respond that anyway, the problem of inequality among individuals is a mainly an issue for domestic policies such as taxation and welfare. That is of course true. But the stagnation of the bottom incomes in rich states combined with climbing middle incomes in developing states are likely to have a destabilizing effect also on the rich states of the West and have in fact, as we all know, already triggered protectionism and opposition against trade and investment agreements. Therefore, I submit that a cross-border material inequality of individuals' living standards is a proper focus of international law, too. The third trend is the extension of international social rights in three dimensions. The first dimension is the extension in ratione materie. As you know, international social rights have radiated into all subfields of international law that are relevant for the global social question. The imbuement with rights has left deep marks in the international law of development, in international labor law, in international trade law, including procurement law, international subsidies law, and the law of trade-related aspects of intellectual property. In international investment law, in finance law, including World Bank conditionalities and the memorandums of understanding on austerity measures and on sovereign debt worked out. Social rights have radiated into the international law of natural disasters, into refugee and migrant law, and finally into anti-corruption law. And importantly, the principal value of this infiltration does not lie in those rights independent enforceability as isolated legal entitlements. But probably more importantly, the oozing of human rights, notably social rights, into the various branches of international law has created the obligation for all other non-human rights specific law applying institutions to interpret their regimes, rules and principles in the light of international social rights. But exactly this individualization and the legalization going with it is not unequivocally beneficial or progressive. The imbuement of the various regimes with human rights considerations has been criticized as an inappropriate or even as a strategical deflection from institutional and structural root causes of underdevelopment, of poverty and of material inequality. It might indeed unduly divert from the macroeconomic analysis, and I will return to this critique at the end. Now I come to the next extension of international social rights, and this is territorial. The extraterritorial application of international ESC rights has been discussed intensely. The political starting point of this new movement is the claim that, due to global interdependence, any legal, political and administrative action of states in the fields of trade and other areas of the economy increasingly have negative repercussions on the social rights of people situated outside the territory of the state. Importantly, the core issue is not state conduct, for example, police action or military action outside state borders, but it is rather the extraterritorial effects of measures which are adopted inside the state. This includes the state's regulation, or rather its non-regulation of business actors domiciled inside its territory, but whose activities may have an adverse impact on social rights enjoyed by persons outside the territory. Trade laws, import restrictions, 
export subsidies for agricultural products, or the refusal to award development aid, potentially affects the housing, it affects the food and work of persons situated in other states. And therefore, this is possibly also related to their social rights. Of course, in times of economic globalization, every state is somehow connected to the populations and to business activity in other states. Governmental action or governmental inaction may produce detrimental social and economic effects on the other side of the globe. That's a truism. But the result can, of course, not be unbounded legal state obligations to honor the social human rights of every person on the globe. We need criteria which determine the threshold above which extraterritorial human rights-based obligations of state A are triggered in the first place. And this threshold might be discussed in terms of jurisdiction. However, the criterion of control, which has emerged from the case law, for example, of the European Court of Human Rights and the uh, Covenant on Pol Civil and Political Rights, control as the main element of jurisdiction hardly fits or doesn't fit at all in constellations of mere extraterritorial social effects of intraterritorial state action. It does not make sense to look for control of the U.S. legislator awarding a rice subsidy to domestic farmers, which harms African farmers, to give an example. The U.S. Congress will never control the African farmers in any way. In 2011, a group of scholars and activists adopted the Maastricht principles on extraterritorial obligations of states in the area of economic, social and cultural rights to identify thresholds which would trigger social obligations. But these principles are exceedingly broad, too broad, I would say. Other scholars, and I include our dear professor Nihal Bhutta here, espouse a narrower and a more normative conception of jurisdiction. These scholars demand, on top of state A's factual capacity to influence the social rights of persons in state B, they ask for an additional normative relationship between state A and those persons outside the state to trigger state A's human rights duties. One variation is the claim that a state's obligation to respect and protect and maybe even fulfill social human rights outside the territory is a corollary to the state's political authority over those persons. But I think um, that the better arguments speak in favor of a broader conceptualization of extraterritorial social rights obligations because, that's my main argument, there is no international tort law or criminal law available against the brute exercise of transnational naked power or naked violence, be it physical or economic. Um, so because there is no fallback other law, if we restrict human rights obligations uh, to relationships of political authority, then this would leave victims of, so to speak, unpolitical exercises of power without any remedy. Still, we cannot assume that all states are responsible for the social rights of persons everywhere on the globe. And the crucial question therefore remains what a political scientist has called the boundary problem. And this is a problem which I can resolve here. But I come now to the third extension of international social rights, and that's the extension of duty bearers beyond states. Social human rights obligations have been firstly extended to international organizations, and second, to business actors. One constellation involves international financial institutions, which directly or indirectly finance state policies or development projects which affect social rights of the populations. For example, the right to housing, affected by resettlements and evacuation to build new infrastructure. And when the lending or other forms of financial support to states or their banks is conditioned on privatization requirements or on other austerity prescriptions, such as budget cuts, downsizing the bureaucracy and so on, then this may have serious impacts on the social services in the borrowing states ranging from housing schemes over the healthcare and education system to pensions and other social security benefits. Another scenario is the restructuring of sovereign foreign debts in which international organizations are involved. Prominent example, the credit and bailout arrangements between 
the IMF, the European Commission and the European Central Bank and various EU member states uh, towards Greece. Against this background, notably the World Bank and the IMF have been a main target of attacks by the globalization critics even more than the states themselves and have been blamed, often in a summarial fashion, for creating and perpetuating economic and social injustice. I think that this reproach overstates the actual power and means of the international organizations. But the idea that the organizations themselves should in principle be held accountable for negative social effects to which they contribute is valuable. The World Bank's new environmental and social framework setting of 2016 is attentive to social impacts of its investment project financing. In this political document, the bank does not assume any own human rights obligation, but commits itself to conduct a due diligence of proposed projects, and this due diligence covers the environmental and social risks and impacts related to the project. Next problem is that the international organizations depend on states as members and as implementers of the organization's measures. And generally speaking, I would say that for this reason, the organization's obligations are arguably mostly only subsidiary or complementary to the involved state's obligations. And a related question is how the sphere of human rights responsibility of organizations can be demarcated in the first place given that international organizations do not have any jurisdiction, no territorial jurisdiction, which normally determines the human rights obligations of states. They have a functional jurisdiction, um, but that's a different matter. And then there's also the question about the substance of potential social human rights obligations of international organizations. It is quite clear that international organizations are not obliged to fulfill social rights. For example, the World Bank would not be obliged to furnish housing to populations transferred by projects. But many scholars and some practitioners argue that international organizations are saddled with obligations to respect social human rights. That's, for example, what the independent expert on guiding principles on foreign debt and human rights uh, says. And in the context of financing and lending and debts, specific obligations of the international financial institutions to take into account or to pay consideration to human rights have been postulated. I think this is a very interesting new type of obligation that does not fit with the classic trias in human rights law, respect, protect, fulfill. The second type of actors are business actors. The trend is not clearly moving towards direct human rights obligations of business, although there is one investment arbitration which postulates a direct human rights obligation uh, on the right to water uh, in Obasa and versus Argentina of 2016. Here, an ICSID tribunal for the first time examined a social human rights-based counterclaim filed by a host state on the merits the tribunal ultimately rejected the counterclaim, but Obita Dictum postulated a direct business obligation of Urbasa to respect, only to respect the human right to water. I think that direct social human rights obligations of business are problematic because they erode the public and private spheres. Uh, notably, there is the danger that states might shirk their human rights obligations and try to re deflect from their own responsibility. Not even the so-called zero draft published last year by the UN Human Rights Council's open-ended intergovernmental working group on business and human rights, not even this zero draft uh, proposes direct human rights obligations of business. It seems more promising for holding business actors to account to force the states to exercise their duty to protect and to regulate and to shape a tighter web of both national and international social law, a law which would be more fine-tuned than just human rights, a law which would be composed of international labor law, international social rights, and international environmental law. 
And this could realize better the social responsibility of business. The fourth trend is that courts and other monitoring bodies have begun to adjudicate on social rights. Notably, the, social, the constitutional courts of South Africa and India have issued judgments on constitutional social rights and have interpreted these constitutional rights in the light of international law and in the light of foreign law. This is a new body of case law, which is revolutionary. It's revolutionary for two reasons. First, it is transforming social rights from rather programmatic provisions into operational entitlement. Second, this case law has the potential to transnationalize these social rights to transnationalize them because the courts and the committees can enter into a judicial dialogue and are likely to align the guarantees to each other. On the European regional level, the European Court of Human Rights has acknowledged and has built up social rights under the European Convention on Human Rights. And this evolution, which is brought about by judicial activism, to some extent revises the original setup of human rights protection in Europe with a convention on the one hand and a European social charter on the other hand. And in the European Union, the Charter of Fundamental Rights adopted in 2000 has become operational now in the European Union Court's case law. And this chapter contains a whole title, uh, Solidarity. Uh, so there is uh, much going on there. And on the universal plane, the first optional protocol of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the first protocol adopted since 2013, it's in force, uh, I think, yeah, individual communications are now possible about violations of the social rights in the covenant. And this gives it them much more teeth than just through state reporting. Some individual communications have already led to the findings of violations of social rights, for example, right to housing in Spain. Now, the last fifth trend I note is the function of social rights as a background grid for practices and procedures which seek to prevent cross-border social harm. These tools are first social impact assessment, second human rights impact assessments, uh, and social due diligence, and also social and human rights mainstreaming. Specifically in the constellation of treaty making, not only the special rapporteur's guiding principles on human rights impacts assessment, but also the social committee, the social rights committee of the UN, and the Council of Europe, they all assert that state parties of human rights treaties are obliged to perform a human rights impact assessment before the conclusion of trade and investment agreements by virtue of their pre-existing human rights obligations. One legal explanation is that states should avoid subsequent treaties that impose obligations inconsistent with pre-existing agreements. Unresolved legal questions are when uh, that is, at which threshold the soft or hard obligations to conduct such social impact assessments or due diligence is triggered. And the other question is, how far do these impact assessment must go and how intense must they be? And a further question is, to whom these, I would say, deliberative and procedural obligations would be owed to one or more states, to the international community as a whole, or to the potentially affected individuals outside the state. I'm now reaching my interim conclusion. None of the reported legal phenomena and trends has appeared out of the blue. Concepts of mission civilisatrice, solidarity, development, cooperation and protection have been endorsed in international law and scholarship from the beginnings of the discipline and often with Eurocentric overtones, with paternalist overtones, and with racist overtones. But in an era of a new global awareness about the fallouts generated by ruthless globalization, the trends I mentioned manifest the recognition not only of 
interstate obligations or solidarity, as it was notably in the classic international law of development, but it manifests an additional, very weakly legalized responsibility for the material welfare of individuals independent of those person's nationality and independent of the place of residence. And I call this a form of cross-border social responsibility for human beings. The main legal component of this cross-border social responsibility for human beings is an international law-based obligation to properly integrate considerations for the material needs of humans in other states into the domestic decision-making in all relevant fields of law and politics. And in narrow constellations, this cross-border social responsibility may even amount to states' legal obligations to respect, protect, and take into account rights outside their territory. And such a cross-border social responsibility um, is also accepted for international organizations, to a lesser extent for corporate actors as well. What I have described as a rise of social rights comprises two seemingly contradictory features. On the one hand, the rights function as entitlement is being sharpened, notably through the new enforcement practices. On the other hand, social rights form a mere background noise when they are used as a guideline for the interpretation of hard rules in trade and investment. The dilution of social rights is most obvious in the new tools of social human rights impact assessment and due diligence. However, both functions of rights, the function as enforceable entitlement on the one hand and as mere interpretative guideline on the other hand, can coexist without canceling each other out. Taken as a whole, the social thickening of international law in form of the cross-border social responsibility for humans has a constitutional significance and could therefore be approached in a constitutional mindset. I suggest to employ the lens of global constitutionalism and to fuse the constitutionalist and the social dimension of international or transnational law in order to reconceptualize the problems and in order to provide an intellectual framework for policy proposals. Global constitutionalism so far focused on the trinity of rule of law, human rights, and democracy. But the positive and negative feedback loops between the realization of classical liberal goals on the one hand and the guarantee of minimally acceptable material living conditions on the other hand make it impossible to satisfy the classic constitutional quests without simultaneously addressing the social question. And in an interconnected world, both the social question and the constitutional question have gone global in the sense that the principles, institutions, and procedures developed within nation states cannot fulfill their functions without extension to international and foreign actors. The fusion of the social and the constitutionalist program to form an agenda of global social constitutionalism has the benefit of upgrading the social concern to the level of importance it deserves. And this fusion is apt to rescue global constitutionalism from Eurocentrism and from blindness towards the collateral damage of economic globalization. But this agenda must address three qualifications. First, the emergence of the more social international law, which espouses a cross-border responsibility for individuals, does not comprise the establishment of central institutions comparable to welfare state bureaucracies. The absence of a central democratic lawmaker, of a central budget, and of centralized enforcement branch makes it impossible to design and implement global insurance schemes, impossible to define and successfully levy global progressive taxes. So the structure of global social governance remains decentralized, horizontal, with various state and non-state actors forming a net network of social governance bodies. And this form of governance without enforcement powers is, of course, typical for international law, but it's hard to see how such a decentralized system could ever manage money flows and contribute to redistributing money. The second qualification is that even the modest unfolding of the social dimension of international law without any 
global top-down scheme of redistribution at first sight sits ill with an equally tangible backlash in other more traditional areas of international law. Classic core jobs of international law, such as preventing military conflict, guaranteeing stable territorial boundaries, and providing for interstate dispute settlement, are currently badly fulfilled. But the seeming dissonance between open critique amounting to non-compliance in the areas of international military security and territorial issues on the one hand, and a heightened increased demand for international social rules on the other hand, is no real internal contradiction. The symbolic topics such as sovereignty and non-intervention, which motivate national resistance against the prosecution of high politicians before the International Criminal Court, for example, these symbolic topics are in a way merely verbally, rhetorically detached from the economic interdependence in the political discussion. In reality, the populist rhetorics which insists on state sovereignty, on territorial integrity and on national identity these rhetorics are a typical reaction to the anxiety, the anxiety of governments and of the voters caused by economic globalization. And for this reason, tackling the global social question is one precondition for the successful delivery of the classic jobs of international law, peace and territorial stability. The third qualification is that, of course, the ongoing socialization of international law and the, my framing within a global social constitutionalism, this is of course a purely incremental strategy. It's a reformist approach and it lacks a revolutionary impetus. And this might be criticized as being too moderate. However, I think we should remember that both international legal experiments on the governance of the global social question that were at the extreme ends of the political spectrum have not fared. I'm speaking of the basically human rights free new international economic order of the 1970s, which sits on the one side, and on the other side, the rights floating ne neoliberalism of the 1990s, which sits at the other side of the spectrum. Both neglect human rights and both have not contributed much to global social justice. Against this historical experience, a reform strategy with international social rights, and notably the right not to live in abject poverty, as its centerpiece is worth trying. And along that line, global constitutionalism as an ism, an ideology, should move further towards embracing the social dimension. And this can, can be done, and should be done analytically, by acknowledging that the extant bits and pieces of international social law already do form part of international law, and it's a kind of a, you can see it as a body, as I did, and second, normatively, by developing legal arguments, processes and strategies to strengthen the social aspiration, global constitutional justice could be promoted more. Thank you.